Hello, everybody. I would like to welcome you all to this uh, e-seminar titled Cancer and Kidney Transplantation. What is the minimum waiting time for kidney transplantation after a pre-existing malignancy? My name is Geir Mjørn and uh, I am a nephrologist from Oslo and I am a member of the Descartes Working Group. This seminar will last for about 60 minutes. First, there will be a presentation. After the presentation, there will be a panel debate. The seminar is organized by the Descartes Working Group on Kidney Transplantation. All viewers are kindly asked to submit questions at any time using the Q&A functionality in Zoom. By participating live, participants will earn one European credit for their continuous medical education. This is an exclusive benefit for ERA members only, and to claim the credit, it is compulsory to fill in the survey that appears at the end of the e-seminar. Our speaker today will be Associate Professor Bruno Watschinger. He is a nephrologist at the Medical University of Vienna, Austria. He is also the first author of a paper uh, called Pre-existing Malignancies in Renal Transplant Candidates, Time to Reconsider Waiting Times. We also have two excellent panelists today. Professor uh, Rochelle Elemans is the head of the kidney transplant programs at the Antwerp University Hospital in Belgium. She has a special interest in post-transplant cancer. In 2020, she participated in an ESO transplant learning journey working group, which focused on the management of immunosuppression after post-transplant cancer. And she became the first author of a review paper on this topic, published in 2021. Lisha Perusi is a pediatric nephrologist, chief of the pediatric kidney and liver kidney transplant program at the Regina Margarita Children's Hospital past member of the Descart Working Group and a member of the Certain Working Group, coordinator of the Turin Center of Transplant Child European Reference Network for Pediatric Solid Organ and Hematopoietic Stem Cell Transplantation. Now, first, I would like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Watchinger. I would like to welcome you all uh, for this seminar of the Descartes Group. Uh, it's great that so many of you are actually here uh, to uh, go with us through the problems that we sometimes face in patients that we put on the waiting list uh, when they have pre-existing malignancies. And the question for us to, this afternoon is, when can we actually consider patients to be waitlisted? Can I see? Okay. Working. Sorry about that. I just wanted to leave you some time to see that there's no conflicts of interest for this talk. Well, the, the story is that actually we see many more patients with a pre-existing transplant than we used to see because they were basically excluded from transplantation. And with the increasing age of the patients that we put on, on the waiting list, we also see more patients actually having a pre-transplant malignancy. Uh, on the other hand, we are often concerned that uh, malignancy are dangerous for our patients because we know they are the leading cause of death among solid organ transplant recipients. Uh, then we know that transplant recipients are actually at increased risk of developing or dying of cancer, uh, especially if we compare them to the general population. And we think that post-transplant uh, malignancies are probably challenging to treat and have a bad prognosis, which might not be true with the new uh, uh, treatment uh, uh, possibilities that we see now. Uh, on the other hand, we must admit that the mortality of which can be attributed to cancer increases with age at transplantation. Uh, that's not very different from, from the general population. And you can see that at a higher age, over 65, of course, you would expect more patients to die from cancer than in the younger 
age groups uh, as can be seen from this uh, study published a couple of years ago. Uh, at the same time, looking at those studies, looking at uh, solid organ transplant recipients, uh, we also always need to consider looking at the compiled data that they are not the same for every single organ. Uh, but that for kidney, and that's our main issue of, or main organ of interest, it's probably less than it would be for heart or for lung or for other organs. So that's an issue that we that we need to consider looking at the at the literature. Uh, but we know there's a risk of malignancy, but we need to find out or try to evaluate what the malignancy risk in transplant recipients actually is and what does it mean this risk what does it mean for our decision making for the individual patient uh, and we usually rely on the standard incidence ratio and the standard incidence ratio is expresses basically the risk or the malignancy risk uh, which is compared to the risk that we can find in the general population. So basically we compare it to a baseline risk in the general population. And for instance, in transplantation, if you have a seer of five, this means you have a five time excessive risk, uh, which is an additional risk in the situation of transplantation. And if we look at those Years, those standardized incidence ratios uh, and look at different cancers that you can see from top to bottom, then you, then you appreciate that patients who receive the transplant have a higher rate of malignancies compared to the general population, because that's what, what Sears actually express. And if you look at the at the line on top of the red line, then you can see there are some cancers that have a very high risk and they are basically um, infection related cancers. And the other cancers that have a lower risk are non infectious related cancers. And another study, which was done in the southern part of Europe. In, in Italy a couple of years ago, shows again for some different uh, tumors, the sears uh, which differ according to the tumor. And if we pick like one class of, of tumor, then you can see that for instance, for the kidney cancer, the sear is about four in renal transplant recipients. So renal transplant recipients carry a higher risk, a four time higher risk compared to a general population. If they receive a transplant, the risk for kidney uh, cancer is four times higher. So that's the additional risk for, for instance, kidney, for kidney tumors. But the question is, is it fair to compare a transplant patient with the general population uh, because actually a transplant patient has a better comparison that's himself not being transplanted and staying on dialysis. So the question actually occurs that we should actually compare the risk of a transplant patients once we want to put him on the waiting list to the best he could ever be or could ever get which is a dialysis patients, and we should probably not compare it to the baseline risk of the general population. And now if you look at dialysis patients and take again the, the question of the kidney cancer, then you can see that dialysis patients themselves without being transplanted carry a four time uh, increased risk of developing cancer. So basically there is not a big difference at least for kidney kidney cancers between staying on dialysis and being transplanted. So what this graph shows is that, yes, we do have an increased risk in transplant patients, but at the same time, the 
risk on dialysis is not zero. So you have a baseline risk uh, once as long as you stay on the on dialysis, which is only a little bit higher if you go on to transplantation. So the if you deduct basically the, the risk that the general population risk and then add the dialysis population risk, then you see that there is, of course, for renal patients a, an additional risk, but this risk is lower than compared to the general population. So the best comparison probably, of course, is to compare transplant patients with those patients who are waitlisted for transplantation. And this was done uh, about 20 years ago by Bert Krasiske. And there you see that comparing those two groups staying on dialysis or being transplanted. So it's both this a selected group of patients of transplant uh, um, um, or patients that could be transplanted. You see for some uh, tumors, you actually have a higher risk. And interestingly enough, those are the tumors uh, that are associated with different uh, viruses, uh, HPV, H HPC virus, or uh, EBV virus, uh, like uh, lymphoma or, or something else. So there you can see there is actually an increased risk for being immunosuppressed for virally induced uh, malignancies. But at the same time, for other tumors, as can be seen here in the in the green bars, the risk between waitlisted patients and those being transplanted is not really increased. <coughs> Having said that, it's it's of course important to say that cancer. does cause a substantial mortality risk among organ transplant recipients. That's true for the whole group, of course. Uh, but looking at the, at the cancer-specific death, ri death risk in kidney transplant recipients and comparing those to those to the cancer-specific death risk in cancer patients that were not transplanted, you can see that, again, for some uh, cancers, the risk is elevated. This is a Swedish cancer registry uh, compared to, to the Swedish transplant patients. And you can see for uh, this is true for lymphoma, melanoma, or ure urothelial or breast cancer. And there is another study from the United States, which basically showed the same picture that for some cancers, again, it's melanoma, breast cancer, or bladder cancer, there is an increased uh, cancer-specific mortality uh, when uh, you are transplanted uh, with, a, with a solid organ transplant. So we need to appreciate cancer has an increased risk for death. But being a kidney patient or being a dialysis patient or a transplant patient, you also carry other death risks. And one major death risk that we see in our patients is, of course, the cardiovascular death, death risk, which increases, as you can see in the blue bar, dramatically once the kidney function declines and is very much elevated in dialysis patients, as we all know. And if you see the bars to the far right, then you see that in patients who are transplanted, of course, this is a selected group, we must appreciate that, but still the cardiovascular risk is dramatically reduced and nearly the same as the cancer risk maybe. So being transplanted gives you a better chance to survive and not to die from a cardiovascular event. So I think our task is to balance the risk, the risks that the patient has, one, the one that we fear which is the malignancy risk. And at the same time, we should always look at the mortality risk that we might be able to reduce in the patients and basically weigh those two uh, uh, dangers or risks against each other before we make a, a decision for our patient. 
We do know that uh, patients on dialysis uh, carry a high mortality. There is about a 5% yearly mortality rate, uh, according to the Eurotransplant uh, reports, which has not changed over the, year, over the years a lot. So it is not really safe to stay on dialysis either. So now we end up with the question, should patients with a prior malignancy stay on dialysis? Or should we consider them to be transplanted? Having appreciated that there is other risks if you stay on dialysis. And again, we have changed our minds, apparently. Uh, the UNOS database uh, shows you that the number of patients with the pre-existing malignancies that are actually transplanted have increased to about 8% over the years. So we actually are more uh, prone to, to uh, take patients onto the waiting list and actually transplant them. This is especially true, as you can see from this uh, collection of data for solid organ transplants. Uh, so, yes, I think we can consider or we should consider patients with a prior malignancy uh, to be transplanted or at least selected patients. Uh, but then the next question arises, at what time after the diagnosis of, of a malignancy could we actually go on and transplant the patient? And of course, I think there's consensus and that has not changed over the years different guidelines, as you can see here, that if you have an uncontrolled cancer, a metastatic disseminated form of cancer and an active malignancy, uh, we would not go uh, uh, and transplant the patients. Uh, and if you look at the different uh, guidelines that uh, have suggested otherwise uh, waiting times for non-active cancers, then you can see there's a very heterogeneous picture of, of waiting times between no waiting time at all or minimum of two years, two to five years, five years. Uh, and these early guidelines, this was a, a, a kind of overview uh, published 10 years ago, basically relied on old data uh, which were not really collected in a structured way. And of course, with the low number of patients uh, that were actually in these uh, considerations or basis for these considerations, it was not really an evidence-based uh, uh, approach at the time. Uh, just last year uh, or two years ago, uh, the KDGO, uh, published clinical practice guidelines, and you may all know them. And again, they show that for different kinds of cancers, and we could discuss this later on, uh, certain waiting times, uh, which uh, might be seen differently in from the side of oncologists or, or in some other centers. So that's basically something uh, that can be discussed, I think, uh, and should probably be discussed on an individual basis for each, each single patient. So, of course, we can say, well, we wait longer, but at the same time, I told you, we accept the risk of dialysis, uh, but we could say, well, if, if the patient is not, not transplanted, then he cannot recur uh, the, or the cancer cannot recur after transplantation, but we leave out the idea that probably during dialysis, the cancer could recur at the same time, uh, or whether we really, or whether we really help the patients if we leave him on dialysis for a longer period of time. Uh, and I think in this regard, it's also interesting to see that patients that stay on dialysis uh, have a five-year cumulative incidence of any cancer. So again, the risk of malignancy is there as well in patients who are on dialysis. And if you look at the curve, it's very similar or 
uh, close to the curve that um, was published a couple of years ago in transplant patients in the presence or absence of mTOR inhibitors. So again, I think we need to balance our ideas, our hopes for the patients and the possibilities uh, uh, on the background of the risk that dialysis patients actually carry. Uh, and a Norwegian study in, in nearly 400 patients with a pre-transplant cancer looked at the outcome according to the waiting time after the diagnosis of the cancer and the waiting time until the transplant actually happened. Uh, and what was uh, uh, shown there was that actually waiting longer, this was a retrospective study, of course, uh, did not really change the reasons for death, the reason for death for, from a recurrent cancer or from a de novo cancer, uh, which could be an argument that waiting longer does not really change the course uh, of the of the malignancy uh, and the risk of or or dying risk of malignancy, and the recent paper in in prostate cancer patients uh, of the uh, Swedish uh, groups uh, showed that the cancer specific survival was not really different over 15 years whether the patients uh, uh, were transplanted or were not transplanted uh, at least for prostate cancer. Another idea uh, to look at the cancers in a more specific and more defined way is probably using new methods like genomic profiling. And in, in this case report, uh, the uh, authors described that after genomic profiling of breast cancer, uh, the transplant uh, was done very fast after the diagnosis of breast cancer, uh, after kind of balancing the risk because of the uh, genomic uh, uh, footprint. And uh, at least in these two patients, uh, five, it was uh, successful for five years without uh, any recurrence of the breast cancer. Uh, that's the paper of the Descartes group that was alluded to by, by Gear at the beginning and, and can be found in the NDD. And the recent compilation, uh, which was published last year, a consensus expert opinion statement published in the American Journal of Transplantation. Actually, two back-to-back uh, -back papers tried to incorporate new knowledge uh, for the recommended wait time uh, in solid organ candidates. Uh, for instance, with a history of prostate cancer, and you can see that at least for uh, some prostate cancers with low or intermediate risk, uh, it might be feasible uh, to bring the patients to transplantation uh, uh, without any significant wait time at all. Uh, there could be patients uh, who have breast cancer uh, in which uh, no wait time might be also feasible, especially if those, uh, if these uh, uh, types of breast cancer carry an excellent uh, uh, five-year disease-specific survival. Uh, and for melanoma, for instance, again, uh, the strict either no transplant at all or it wait, wait at least five years uh, might also be uh, 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 kind of changed for uh, specific uh, patients with with lower grade tumors. So that's something that should be discussed for every patient. And we should probably not, uh, uh, before asking our oncologists, deny a transplant for, for transplant candidates. So we have to weigh again the cancer recurrence with all cause mortality on the other site, uh, which is, of course, another important endpoint for the patients. So if we put it together somehow in a, in a uh, graph, then we could look at the bottom with the malignancy risk, where I showed you that dialysis patients 
also carry a malignancy risk, which is a little bit higher, of course, in transplant patients. But at the same time, uh, the cardiovascular risk in dialysis patients is very high and can be reduced uh, in transplant patients. So basically, the risk benefit could still be uh, uh, significant if the patient receives a transplant, the overall pen benefit. So putting things together, uh, let me just summarize some key points. We know that uh, malignancy are an emerging problem in the aging population, of course, and we will see more of patients with uh, a pre-existing malignancy uh, that remaining on dialysis is associated with an increasing cancer and also mortality risk um, that we need to reconsider the waiting times that we were used to over the last decade uh, and we may be able to shorten it for a ver variety of malignancies. Uh, I think it's important to discuss uh, the, these questions with an oncologist uh, for every single patient. And the most important thing I think is that we also need to collect more information on the different tumors, which should be more granular so that we learn for the future. Uh, and this should be done, of course, prospectively. And, and the oncologists, I think, are important. Uh, we need them to make the decisions uh, because they know uh, how they could treat the tumor. And there's so many new uh, anti-tumor therapies that could be discussed and the patient could be treated before being put on the waiting list or even after uh, the patient is transplanted. transplanted. They know about the genetic markers uh, and I think it's uh, important that we have an open discussion uh, with the oncologist and then, of course, together with the patient in order to find out what the individual risk is and how we could help uh, the patients in the best way that we can. So I would like to thank you for listening to it and I apologize for this little technical problem at the moment, at the beginning. Okay. So. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Bruno. That was an uh, excellent presentation and it was perfectly timed. Um, now uh, I would like to ask uh, if any of our panelists would like to comment on uh, any part of the presentation. And first, I think this uh, uh, there were a lot of uh, uh, plots and charts, but uh, I think the one with the uh, KDGO uh, publication was uh, maybe very interesting and uh, quite uh, new. Uh, would you like to comment on that, uh, Rochelle? Uh, we cannot hear you. Oh, sorry, I was still on mute. My, my apologies. So yes, I, I think that many people are aware of these guidelines with this table with proposed waiting times between cancer remission and transplantation. And although the authors do acknowledge that these proposed times, they are based on very little evidence, it's a 2D recommendation, but still I am a bit afraid that the table gives the nephrologist maybe a false sense of robustness. Um, it, it seems very black and white, while in fact, I think it's more than 50 shades of gray. Uh, and nephrologists might be uncomfortable deviating from these recommendations, although as Bruno told, um, you really need to look at it in a case per case basis. Um, and then sometimes maybe it's good to, to uh, deviate from these um, uh, rough recommendations um, for, for, for two basic reasons. Uh, first of all, the, in these tables, they really oversimplify the cancer diagnosis. 
Um, I, can you maybe uh, show the, the table again? Is that, a, is that possible? Yes, I can, I can do that. Uh, let me see. I think it's in the middle somewhere. Yeah, I, I have it, I think, even at the end, but I, I ran into the same problem as I did. Uh, that uh, I cannot move. Oh yeah, that I cannot move the slides. Here, here we have them. Okay, yeah. I hope you so, can so see if, them. If you take, for example, the breast cancer, it's only divided in early or advanced, with recommended waiting times being two and five years respectively. But in reality, the situation is much more complex, and the prognosis is not only based on the tumor size and the lymph node invasion, but the biological characteristics of the tumor, the histological type, the grade, the hormone sensitivity, and also the, the uh, response to initial therapy, they are much more indicative of the recurrence risk. So um, um, if, if you show this table to any oncologist, they will say, well, it, it's, it's much more complex than that. Um, so um, I really want to make a plea to, to discuss it uh, every time with your oncologist. So that's one thing. And the other thing is that in these guidelines, they, they say, well, we, we often choose for a five-year waiting time. And this is based on the fact that most cancers recur within the first five years. Okay, that's, that, that may be true. But as Bruno pointed out, there is this uh, competing risk problem. Um, the longer you keep the patients on dialysis, the, the sicker they get. And at some point, they may become so frail that they even lose their chance of being transplanted or die. But even when they are eventually transplanted after five years, so to say, we also um, need to know uh, that, that a longer dialysis vintage, it will continue to impact on the graft and patient survival afterwards. So you really, really want to make a very balanced decision before you sentence someone to five years more on dialysis. That was the main point that I wanted to stress here. Yeah, I think I would, I would like to support that because I really try to, to uh, uh, involve oncologists. And of course, you need to, to get the specialists involved. And luckily enough, at our university, we have specialists for, for every single tumor, more or less. Uh, and especially talking about melanoma, if it's an in situ melanoma, uh, this would probably be, could be probably transplanted right away if you're sure that it was in situ and this is not really reflected in the, in the um, uh, Kidigo guidelines. At the same time, we have patients with a melanoma where our oncologist says, well, don't touch those patients, please don't, don't give them a transplant because you, you might, they're doing fine, but they're still, they still have a high risk uh, of recurrence. And, and in, in fact, I also, I think I brought one, one slide uh, with, yeah, here, which I just got from, from our oncologist here. Uh, and, and here you can see that the stage is for that's uh, the relapse free, sorry for being German and melanoma specific uh, survival. It's very, very different over 10 years in different grades. So that's something that we really should consider. And that's the reason I think we as, ne we as nephrologists are not aware of all the different uh, uh, specialties of, of every single organ uh, that we should discuss it with them. Um, can I uh, interrupt you a little bit and ask you about some specific cases, maybe? Um, uh, this question goes out to all of you, really. Uh, you just uh, said something, uh, uh, Rochelle said something about breast cancer, so I just thought uh, of this um, if we could discuss some examples. So what if you have a 30-year-old uh, 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 woman on dialysis who uh, just finished treatment for breast cancer? Uh, 
with the regional lymph node metastasis treated with surgery, chemo, and radiation, but who is uh, considered to be free from disease? How would you? I'm not going to pressure you into saying the number of years she would have to wait, but how would you start just thinking about it? And who would you contact? And how would you uh, move forward to planning a, a possible transplant for this patient? Uh, maybe I can uh, reply first, uh, if you agree. So uh, I, I think that here again, we, we don't have enough information to get an idea on our prognosis with, with what you say. Uh, we, we need to know the exact tumor size and the number of lymph nodes involved and, and these uh, histological uh, typing, the hormone sensitivity. Um, these are all things that were, will be very important to uh, predict the prognosis, uh, so the risk of recurrence. And then a second thing is the time to the risk of recurrence. This is also something that you should ask the oncologist because some cancer types, they will tend to um, recur within two or three years, um, while others are uh, can... Um, still recur after more than five years. So, and, and very roughly speaking, the most aggressive ones, they will recur first. So, um, uh, and, and, and the, the, the less aggressive ones, like, like the hormone positive cancers, they can recur later. So um, I think this is something you have to take into account um, when, you, when you discuss the waiting time. And also here, the Kidigo guidelines could give a, a little bit of a strange idea that a very advanced cancer you need to, to wait five years for. Well, in fact, maybe you will, you will see a recurrence earlier and it will be the other way around for the, for the less aggressive ones. Okay, thank you. But um, what about something uh, smaller or simpler? Um, what if you have, um, let me see, what if you have a 50 year old uh, uh, dialysis patient who just uh, had a nephrectomy uh, due to a small renal cell carcinoma with uh, three centimeters of diameter, uh, like a renal uh, clear cell carcinoma, how would you um, proceed? Well, I think it would be good news if it's small, because that's what every, everybody says. But again, there uh, we would need to know more about the tumor. Uh, we we should look at the histology. Uh, we would, uh, I think, we would be asked by an oncologist uh, whether there were sarcomatoid features who, which have uh, worse prognosis or whether there was a tumor necrosis uh, there because this could actually impact on the on the waiting time and and the differentiation grade also so i think we should not jump uh, from the size alone uh, to to defining uh, no waiting time for this particular patient so i think we have to have a, a, a more defined look there and, and and discuss it yes so so gear uh, what was the size of the tumor um, three centimeters okay so if it is a three centimeter tumor um, um for, from let's say a clear cell renal uh, clear cell renal cell carcinoma then this is called a, a t1a tumor so the, the smallest ones um and if you um um, then use these online calculators uh, to estimate the recurrence in the general population. Then it will uh, it will tell you that the chance of a recurrence is only seven percent after five years. So that means that um, yeah, if you uh, if you um, consider this five percent mortality risk of staying on dialysis per year then it seems not to be fair to keep this patient waiting for years 
for this low risk of recurrence. Um, while, uh, while I think in the KDIGO guidelines, they would suggest two years for a, a, a tumor over three centimeters. So here again, I, I have the feeling that uh, it's much more complex. Uh, and you mentioned the risk calculators. Uh, how, how helpful are these uh, calculators? What, what do we know about them? Yes, yes, that's of course a, a very important issue because uh, oncologists, they, they, they commonly use these calculators, um, but, uh, uh, and they give a rough idea about the risk of cancer recurrence and mortality, but we have no dialysis or transplant specific calculators. And we, we do know that tumors often behave more aggressively after transplantation probably at least in part because of the re uh, reduced immune cancer control. And this may also apply to some extent to dialysis patients who also have an impaired immune system. So um, taking this together, I think they, you can use these calculators to get a rough idea, but keep in mind that they may be a little bit too optimistic for our dialysis and transplant patients. Um, the, the, the truth may be a little bit, uh, or, or the, the risk may be somewhat underestimated. Yeah, it's, maybe it's different with different types of uh, populations. And I would like to ask you, Lisha, since you are a, a professor in pediatrics, uh, what would be the view here from the pediatric uh, perspective? Okay, thank you, Gear, for the question. Children are a world without guidelines, mostly and for most aspects, because they are so, uh, the situations are so rare and the numbers are so small that guidelines always uh, are, are not uh, of great help. I just wanted to share with you some, some data because not everybody is uh, well aware uh, about numbers of children and why a child can develop uh, a renal failure after having had a cancer, because the, well, the childhood uh, situation is quite different. So first point is that childhood cancer is a rare disease. These are figures from the American Cancer Society and the in USA, for instance, in 2014, over the all pediatric population of the United States, uh, there were new cases were about 15,000. Uh, although uh, it's a, being a rare disease, cancer is the first cause of mortality in children, but the therapy improval have been um, huge, and now the survival is over 85% for, uh, considering uh, all types of tumors. And as you can see, the types of tumor we can see in children is, are very different from those you'll, you'll see in adults. There are mostly uh, leukemia and lymphomas, but other tumors are central nervous systems, sarcomas and neuroblastomas, and a small percentage of renal tumors. So what uh, the, is basically very different with the adults is the histological type. There are no carcinoma in pediatrics, and mostly are sarcomas or blood, uh, blood cancer. But uh, what um, we can say is that it's, uh, uh, if survival is very high now, over 85%, we still have, uh, and we see an impact of acute and chronic comorbidities involving also the kidney. So which is this? which are these scenarios that we can see with children? So when we can have a damage to the kidney due to the direct infiltration, the tumor load, and the effect of chemo, radio, and uh, um, intercurrent problems like calcium phosphate and uric acid deposition, which most of the time are quietly dealt. This situation leads to uh, late onset chronic kidney disease along years, and it involves uh, uh, in about one to 2% of the children. And this, for instance, is what has been re recently, very recently reported by the Child and Cancer Survivor Study um, from the United States, but there are similar studies also in Europe and uh, in Australia, and the figures are almost, almost the same. So uh, children do develop a chronic renal failure along years. And as you can see here, it's not only um, 
renal tumors that will go into renal failure. As you can see, osteosarcoma is a high risk as well, but also neuroblastoma and uh, leukemias. And this is uh, because of the damage of the therapy. But the problem, well, the problem is not a problem actually, but the, the fact is that re chronic renal failure, even stage five will develop will occur after many years. So mostly, after uh, more than five years. And so when you reach chronic kidney disease stage five and you have the problem for waste listings, five, more than five years have occurred from the original cancer. So the problem is not actually that frequent. What uh, uh, instead is, uh, and this is, uh, for instance, this is the Dutch cohort and uh, you see the figures are the same. C uh, CKD is uh, stage five, 1%. What instead is really changing is that now new children and new diseases are addressed to new therapy like CAR T treatment, bone marrow transplantation for different indications, not only for uh, blood tumors with different side effects. And in these cases, what we are starting to see and every, every center treating children has some cases uh, which are very challenging although, because the, the bone marrow transplant word is putting new indication, new treatments and new diseases are appearing. And mostly uh, what happens is they will develop uh, uh, AKI. Well, in the past, we didn't see these children because they were, uh, they were not surviving AKI or the multiple organ failure that they will develop around uh, this period. And now some of them after AKI will progress into say KD stage five. These are always a small number, but one of the most challenging of these is TMA, which is being more described uh, uh, day by day because severe TMA now, uh, now will survive because we have some types of treatments like eculizumab or rabulizumab or a different type of treatments, very effective. So the mortality is still high, about 30%, but in the past was about uh, 100%. And so we have these children survive with the new drugs, but not unfrequent a progression from AKI to CKD. So we, they will undergo um, bone marrow transplant and they will maybe develop the TMA and they will remain straight on dialysis. So they, they will not develop CKD along years, but the way will exactly, uh, they will um, develop CKD, and so that we will discuss about the need for a transplantation directly passing through AKI to CKD5. And this is a challenging situation. So what happens is the burden of uh, uh, the burden of children who will develop a renal failure and will be in the need for transplant is quite low, uh, but the five years mortality for CKD on dialysis in children is not negligible as well. Uh, we are not uh, uh, so uh, probably so diffusing so much so much this concept in, in the adult world. But eleven percent of the children and mostly will be in the first year after hemodialysis beginning will die because of complication or hemodialysis. This occurs mainly in young children. So still the five years mortality for CKD on dialysis it on, uh, also for children is quite high. If you see 5% year for adults, uh, we will save 11% for five years, which is not negligible. On the other side, the kidney transplantation five years survival is very high, over 96%. So does early transplantation offer an advantage for children surviving cancer? And we have to consider some numbers because the mortality risk for malignancy in CKD and dialysis is very low. So children will not develop a, a tumor just because they are on dialysis so frequently as the adults. But the risk of malignancy in transplanted children, it is significant, but it's a long years. Uh, it's 20% after 10 years of immunity immune suppressor, but mostly they are PTLD and they are mostly treatable. It is very unfrequent that they will die for a PTLD. The risk of recurrence of a primary tumor on the other side is extremely low. It's very rare and there are no figures actually in the literature that which we can allow us to drive any, any consideration and any recommendation. 
And the risk of second tumors on the other side, it is uh, real. It is about 9%, but over 30 years uh, with a cumulative incidence of 9.3%, but along 30 years. So if we put everything all together on a balance, still CKD is uh, uh, worse than cancer. The risk for mortality for CKD and for severe complication for CKD also in children overcomes the risk for recurrence and for a second tumors. So these are, for instance, is a very recent series, which is uh, reports very small numbers compared to what you expect in the adults. The time to transplant, as you can see, uh, uh, is quite uh, low, and the types of transplants were were there very different. So this, what is uh, the main message also here is that uh, it should be discussed with the oncologist, and that. Um, the timing should be really tailored for, for every patient. The recurrence of previous tumors uh, didn't occur in this uh, very small series, which is a uh, uh, Minnesota uh, series and is one of the largest actually published. So for children, basically we have no tumors and the outcome of the kidney transplant was good. So basically uh, we are discussing every single, every single child with the oncology group and we will tailor the timing for every single patient. What can be said that it's globally, the timing is being reduced. For instance, also for the Wilms tumor, Wilms tumor that is the most uh, expected and probably the most frequent, so the two-year timing has been really debated, and this has been debated a long years so from the 2012. But this uh, was a seminal work that demonstrated that uh, uh, the highest risk for recurrence for Wilms tumors is within the first year. So if you don't have any recurrence within the first year, there's no, no reason to wait longer. And particularly for if the tumor was um, uh, isolated, surgically treated, and it was not disseminated or stage four or metastatic. So even for children, case by case should be discussed. Then I don't know if we have some more time. Um, I just wanted to introduce what we are studying now in children in Europe, because this is an interesting aspect, is that uh, the childhood word uh, pressed us to work a lot on, uh, on vaccinations and vac so that we can at least uh, put uh, every measure to, pre to do what we can do for prevent uh, a cancer that could be avoided. And this is HPV. HPV vaccination is quite diffuse use in, in, in Europe in children to prevent uh, tumors of the um, sexually transmitted uh, actually tumors uh, of the genital urinary tract basically uh, but also head and neck. And head and neck tumors uh, are very, very bad and very difficult to, to treat. These tumors have a wide uh, and widely demonstrated uh, correlation with some serotypes of HPV, which are covered by vaccination. But what really uh, we don't know, these are, for instance, the immune persistent on, uh, of um, a response after vaccination in healthy women is what happens depends in uh, dialysis and, back, and the transplanted uh, persons. So the immunogenicity has been explored in some studies. And, as, and what we now know is that the coverage uh, decreases along years, and particularly if the vaccine was done after the transplant, and for instance, what, and particularly for some types of transplant, and if we keep high tachyolimus levels. So what's been doing, doing now in within the, the certain working group, and uh, these uh, slides are courtesy of Rita Hocker, who deal, um, leads these projects, to study the uh, HPV vaccination response in uh, in different subpopulation in the kidney transplant and liver transplant and CKD patients. And from very preliminary results, she demonstrated and she presented this data last week within the certain working group uh, um, for the European meeting that the kidney transplants have uh, uh, reduced tighter of uh, uh, HPV and they reduce their seroconversion 
compared to, uh, to CKD and also to liver transplants, uh, which usually uh, are less immune suppressed. So what we actually don't know right now, which is the best scheme to protect these women, so they should be vaccinated certainly before transplant, but also um, probably uh, the dose should be repeated after transplant to uh, boost the immune response and new data will come uh, from this study, hopefully. Uh, certainly the role of prevention of this tumor through um, vaccination is certainly important, not only for genital, genital neoplasia, but also for other neoplasia. And I, I think that uh, uh, if we start vaccinating children uh, properly and with the complete schemes, they will, this will produce, uh, uh, they will protect also uh, adults because these tumors are usually developed uh, many years afterwards. And uh, thank you for, for letting me speak also a little bit about children. Thank you. Um, thank you, Lisa. I think we have uh, uh, one minute for uh, one last question and some uh, concluding remarks. Uh, I would just like to ask all of you, um, how would age itself accept your willingness to put someone on the waiting list now that we have discussed both adults and uh, also had a nice presentation about uh, the differences between adults and uh, the special things about children uh, do you have any um do you have any specific uh, opinions or knowledge in uh, in uh, the uh, uh, how age affects this uh, decision um... do you mean do you mean independent of of uh, tumor or? Uh, yes, I mean uh, independent. Or if uh, uh, persons who uh, individuals who would have the, a similar tumor, but who has uh, they have if the person is twenty or fifty or fifteen or seventy, how would that affect your decision about the uh, time you should have to wait before going on the waiting list? Well. If I can just, uh, I, I will uh, reply for children. The children, the smaller you have, he is, the higher the risk of mortality on, on dialysis. So uh, if he has a Williams tumor, which is a tumor which is uh, usually limited uh, to the first five years of age, there's no reason to wait time on dialysis because the complications and, and in my experience, these were huge and uh, continuous are <laughs> overwhelming and they are uh, certainly more than the risk for a recurrence of a tumor that will never recur after that age in any case. So there's no reason to wait. For other tumors, it's different, but um, mostly, the, this is the, in most cases, this is the address. I mean, this is the, the trend, not to wait too much time in, on dialysis. Um, thank you. Um, I think uh, we are uh, out of time. Um, I think this has been a very fruitful uh, discussion and I want to thank uh, all those who have uh, participated.